Uh, today is a continuation of the lecture of the prenatal and postnatal growth. Today is uh, postnatal growth number two, in which today we're going to discuss growth theories, then growth of the maxilla, mandible, cranial base, cranial vault, and then the prediction of growth. So we're going to start with the growth theories. Last time we talked about the growth. So what is going to stimulate the growth? What make the organ grow? So we have a couple of theories that are trying to explain how growth happens in the craniofacial region. The first one is the cartilaginous theory, and that basically, depending on the uh, suggestion that the primary determinant of growth is the cartilage, and that is genetically determined, and that the fact is grow the, the fact that the cartilage will grow then will be calcified and will be replaced by uh, bone. So that's kind of like the attractive way of the cartilaginous theory. So basically, if there will be no cartilage, there will be no cranial uh, uh, base or cranial vault. Uh, however, uh, the suture here is a present to um, do the growth in the cranial vault because in the cranial base, in the cranial vault, there is no cartilage, but the cranial base, there is cartilage. So uh, it's the main factor of the growth is the cartilage. That's how the cartilage is theory. While the suture growth is there and it happened due to the organ growing, but this is not the main push for the growth. So if you look to the cranial base, we have the frontal bone, then we have the ethmoidal bone, then we have the sphenoidal bone, and then the occipital bone. And as we discussed before, we have a synchondrosis between the ethmoid and the sphenoidal bone. We call it sphenoethmoidal synchondrosis. We have a somewhat or another one with sphenooccipital. So this theory is attractive because in the, in the base of the skull, that's how it's going to grow. We're going to have a cartilage here, like the epiphyseal plate, that will grow as a cartilage, then it will be calcified and that will increase the growth in the base of the skull. However, and then we have a fusion for this cartilage that will result in stopping of the growth at that area. So that's kind of support how the cartilaginous theory trying to explain how the growth happened at the cranial base. Then you, you kind of struggle to explain, okay, if the cartilage is the main um, growth center, then how can the maxilla grow? And we know that there is no cartilage in the maxilla. Um, the cartilaginous theory people, they believe that the nasal cartilage, the septal cartilage, is the one responsible. So if you go to the anatomy, this is the frontal sinus, and this is the frontal bone, this is the nose, and this is the nasal bone. So you have this part here, which is basically the septal cartilage. And this is the only cartilage in the nasomaxillary complex. So the, the theory is that growth with this septal cartilage will take the maxilla forward. And to, to, to prove this, that we say if they have a patient with achondroplasia, they will have a problem with the growth of this septal cartilage and the cranial base cartilage that will result in mid-phase deficiency. So this is kind of what is supporting this theory. And the mandible, we should we know that we have the condylar cartilage, which is a secondary cartilage. So we have the cartilage that is developed far away from the body of the mandible, then it will remain here, and that will grow and continue dividing until the age of 18. So that will provide the growth uh, for the mandible by the cartilage. So that the areas where the cartilage can, can explain the growth in the craniofacial area. Uh, however, what are the evidence with or against it? The first one, if you transplant cartilage into a neutral um, environment, which means you take the cartilage and you put it outside an environment, outside the patient, outside the, uh, the body, in these cases, if the cartilage is a growth center, so it will grow independently because it's a growth center. Um, however, when you place this cartilage in neutral environment, not all the skeletal bone will act the same. Uh, for example, the epiphyseal cartilage show more activity than the condylar or nasal cartilage. So basically, number one, that's telling us that each cartilage is independent of the environment because they grow differently. Uh, but on the other hand, then not all the cartilage are as important as each other because the epiphyseal plate is very important in the growth. However, it's still telling you that um, cartilage kind of independent in the growth because they grow in a different way. If you remove the septal cartilage, that will result in decrease in the mid-phase advancement, that will do that in, in rabbits or in, in uh, rats. So you remove the um, septal cartilage and then the, the growth of the mid-phase is reduced. If a patient has a trauma to the condyle, we expect to have uh, asymmetry. So we'll have deficiency of the growth at the side of the condyle. Uh, 
so that all of these are telling us that the uh, cartilaginous theory is important theory in explaining the growth. On the other hand, if a patient has a trauma to the condyle, only 75% of the cases they will have an adverse, they will they will have no adverse uh, effect, and and the mandible will grow normally. So if the condyle is the main uh, factor for the growth or the cartilage, we are expecting if the patient has a trauma, all of them will have a reduction in the growth of the mandible. And even the 25 persons who will have an effect, they will have severe mandibular deficiency, but this is not the case. So yes, the condyle is important, but it's not the only one. So here it comes the sutural theory. So basically the sutural theory, it does believe that the suture that present in the craniofacial region is the main site and center for growth. So if you go to the cranial vault, all these sutures are the one that can kind of generating the force to cause growth. All right, and the nasal, um, like this one, the frontomaxillary uh, suture, zygomaticotemporal suture, zygomaticomaxillary suture, and tergopalatine suture, all of these sutures are also responsible for the growth of the maxilla. Now, we know that there is a growth happening on bone deposition happening at these sutures, but the question is, are these sutures independently we're going to grow and pushing the, man, the, mag, uh, the, the cranial vault outside and pushing the nasomaxillary complex? Well, the belief is that there is, there is a growth in the suture, but the general belief is that these sutures are a growth site rather than growth center. And what's happening is basically they are trying to adapt to the growth of the organ underneath them. For example, in the cranial vault, it expands because we have brain getting bigger. And because the sutures are open, so there will be a growth in the suture to accommodate this growth in the brain. Um, and what is kind of causing this problem as well, okay, improving this um, uh, theory as well, the transplantation experiment showed that sutural tissue did not have the innate growth potential as we talked about the cartilaginous one. So when we move the cartilage in a neutral environment, they grow, while the sutural one, they don't do that. So that's something against uh, the sutural theory. So what the general belief is that the sutures are growth site rather than growth center. The third theory is the most functional matrix theory. And in this theory, simply, if there is function, there will be growth. That's how we must explain it. So the growth is happening because there is a functional demand for this growth to happen. And that's in opposite to the cartilaginous and the sutural theory that said the growth is genetically decided. It is genetics that decide the growth, how it's going to be. While the most functional theory, matrix theory, that they say, no, no, genetics is there, but it plays a minor role in the beginning. But what makes this organ grow more and more is basically the function that is mediated by the soft tissue adjacent to the skeletal unit. So the translation of the maxilla will mainly as a result of the pressure that is created by a growth at the suture, which basically is delivered by the growth of the brain. So again, it does not assume that genetics is playing a major role. So the head simply represents a region where a number of specific functions occur, each being carried out by what, we, what, what most called functional cranial component. And this functional cranial component is consists mainly of two elements. That's according to his theory. The first element is the functional matrix, and the second one is the skeletal unit. Then this, what is the functional matrix is basic, basically represent all the tissue, organs, and spaces that performing the function. Muscles, tendons, brain, orbits. While the skeletal unit, it basically bone, cartilage, tendon, that support the function of the functional matrix. Then he divided the functional matrix into periosteal matrix and capsular matrix. And the skeletal unit, he divided into a macroskeletal unit and microskeletal unit. So what is the periosteal matrix? Periosteal matrix basically is consists of the soft tissue that related to the skeletal unit, such as muscles and tendons. So these muscles and tendons are inserted to these bones. That function of these muscles will result in the growth of these bones. While the capsular matrix is an organ and the tissue that, when it's getting bigger, needs to get space more, so that organ will, will grow, that bone, sorry, will grow to accommodate this organ. For example, the orbit in the eye, the brain in the cranium. So that's what he called it the capsular matrix. Then you have microskeletal unit, which basically it's the bone that is composed from smaller bones. 
he called that a microskeletal unit. While the macroskeletal units is several bones that united together to form a, an organ, like or like to, to form a single cranial component. That's to call it the macroskeletal unit. Usually, the preosseal matrix will in, uh, stimulate growth on the microskeletal unit. So basically, muscle tendons will stimulate the growth in the bones, individual bones. While the capsular matrix, like the brain, the organ, the brain, it will stimulate the growth in the macroskeletal unit, the cranium itself. So this kind of diagram trying a little bit to explain it. It's a little bit confusing. However, this is the brain, which we call it the capsular matrix. When it's getting bigger, it will get something else bigger, which is the whole neurocranium. So we call this the macroskeletal unit. So when the brain is getting bigger as a capsular matrix, it's getting the macroskeletal, which made of made of many bones. The cranial vault is made, or the neurocranium is made of many bones. All right, so that's forming the macroskeletal unit. And then when you have, for example, the muscles, the temporalis muscle attached to the temporal bone, that causes the temporal bone to grow a little bit more. That's called the uh, periosteal matrix, the muscles. And the microskeletal unit is the bone, the temporalis. That's the whole idea of the functional matrix theory. So genetics has limited role, mainly function. What support this one, that if the, when the brain stopped growing, the cranial vault stopped growing as well. So that if there is no function, then there is no growth. It's the same with if the eye is not developed, then the orbit will not develop. So no eye, no orbit. And if the teeth are lost, then we don't have alveolus. So no teeth, no alveolus. Again, that support the functional matrix theory. And the functional matrix theory have a good acceptance. So we have so far the cartilaginous theory, which we said that it is there, but it's not the only one. Sutural theory, we said it's the weakest one because simply sutures alone, they can't grow by themselves. Then we have the functional matrix theory, and now we have the remodeling theory. So the remodeling theory was just basically believe that, uh, sorry, I moved that one. Uh, it depends on the bone resorption and bone deposition. So what was happening is if you do bone resorption from the inner side and then bone deposition on the outer side, that will result in a movement of the organ or the movement of the bone. So that's thing that will cause the uh, growth to happen. And that's called the remodeling theory. So that was the main four theories of growth. The remodeling theory, functional theory, functional matrix theory, suture theory, and um, cartilaginous theory. Now, there is the, out of them, the, you can tell that there is one absolutely right or one absolutely wrong. But what we know is the suture theory out of them are the weakest one. And when you, when you study growth, you need to use, in some places, all these theories to try to explain growth. Because growth is really complicated. It's not, especially in the Eurocranium, it's not a straightforward kind of growth. And there is some, as well, principles that is happening when you study growth. The, one of these principles is called the part-counterpart principle. So basically, it believes that the skull is composed of numerous structures that are uh, that as component or parts. And their growth and development is complemented by a series of counterparts. So you have a part here and you have a counterpart to growth. Now, in order to achieve a harmony in the growth, the growth of the part should be balanced to the growth of the counterpart on the other side. Now, this theory believes that the, the scraniocranium is divided by a line that is passing through the posterior maxillary plane. And the structures from other parts over the here are counterparts. So the growth should be balanced from here to here. Now, this theory or this principle is kind of nice trying to explain some sort of malocclusion because simply, if the growth of the maxilla is not accompanied by a good amount of growth from the mandible in the posterior side, as we can see here, a malocclusion will result. So, let's take this as an example. If we have an increasing growth in the nasomaxillary complex, but this growth is not accompanied by a good amount of the mandibular ramus growth, so the maxilla will be moving downward more than the nasopharynx or the mandibular ramus. So that what's going to happen is that the mandible will rotate downward and backward and we're going to have an open bite as a result. So this part counterpart theory is good to try and explain some sort of malocclusion when you have a difference in the growth of the maxilla and mandible. And this is here uh, just a diagram describing what I've just said. The red color is before the maxilla moving downward, and then the blue, the black color is when the maxilla moves downward. So the maxilla moves down, pushing the man with mandible downward and backward. So that's the part. This is the counterpart. If the ramus has grown 
properly, then we could have have a normal occlusion. But because the mang the part and the counterpart they did not grow simultaneously, we have an anterior bite. However, sometimes we have a, a dental pleural compensation that's trying to compensate for this kind of malocclusion. And then we have the something we call it the servo system theory, and this um, theory came because we have two types of cartilage. We have the cart secondary cartilage and we have the primary cartilage. And because the origin of these cartilages are different, uh, they do believe, and their response to the environmental stimulus is different. They believe that they will react differently. So what they said is, they did this theory, they believe that we have two main determinants of growth. The first one is genetic. And this genetic determine the growth mainly of what? The primary cartilage within the cranial base and the nasal septum, all right? And that will determine the growth of the mid-face. While the mandible, because we have the cartilage that is uh, driven from the secondary cartilage, it is uh, responsible for the growth of the mandible, but it changing in the environmental factor, like the closer references with the muscle adaptation, uh, that we can control the growth of the condyle, and uh, by that, controlling the growth of the mandible. So the thing is that how reactive will be this cartilage to the environmental factors? Primary cartilage, less reactive to this factor, so we'll have more genetic uh, effect, while the secondary cartilage are more brought into effect from, uh, secondary, from environmental factors, so they have less genetics and more environmental, like muscles forces. Now we finished talking about all the theories. We're going to move into explaining the growth, how the growth happened in each structure of the craniofacial structure. Basically, we're going to talk about the cranial vault, cranial vault, uh, base, maxillary complex, and nasomaxillary complex, mainly maxilla, and the mandible. Because as our orthodontist, it's all related. We need to know all this kind of growth. So I'm going to do a little bit of revision of the anatomy. I know we have done that before. This is the whole skull. The skull is divided into two parts, neurocranium and visirocranium. If you do this line, this is the face. This is what you call it, the visirocranium. And this one here is the neurocranium, basically surrounding the brain. So that's how you do it. You split it. This is the neurocranium. This is the visirocranium. Now, the neurocranium, which basically surround the brain, it's divided into two parts. This part here is called the cranial vault. While this one is the bottom here, we call it the cranial base. Now, we started from embryology that the cranial vault is made by intramembranous ossification, while the cranial base is made from endochondral ossification, and that's why it's called chondrocranium. So this is the cranial base, and this is the whole is the cranial vault. So let's discuss the cranial vault first. What are the bones that are making the cranial vault? The first one is the frontal bone, parietal bone, occipital bone, temporal bone, and the sphenoidal bone. However, from the frontal and the occipital, it's only, and the temporal, it's only the squamous part of these bones. And from the sphenoid bone, only the greater wing of the sphenoid. And we're going to see how is that. This is the frontal bone, which is this one in the, in the top. Now, if you zoom into the frontal bone, and we take it off, we can see that we have the squamous part, which is this part here, not the vertical part above the eyebrows. This we have here the nasal part, we have here the orbital part, but this one is the squamous part. And this one is the one that is part from the cranial vault. Then we have the parietal bone, which is this big massive bone covering the skull and covering the brain, and it's all of it is part of the cranial vault. Then we have the temporal bone, which is this big bone here. That's called the temporal bone. And the temporal bone, only the squamous part of the temporal bone is part of the cranial vault. So if you look at the temporal bone, it has the squamous part. It has the bitromastoid part. It has the zygomatic process, tympanic process, styloid process. But only the squamous part is the one that is part of the cranial vault. Then we have the occipital bone. If you look at the occipital bone, this is the occipital bone here. And we have a line here because the occipital bone is made by uh, intramembranous and endochondral ossification. So we have something we call it the superior nautical line, which is this line here. And this line divided the cranial vault part, which is this one, from the cranial base part, which is this one. So this, the part above of the uh, nautical cord, it's called the superior, above the superior uh, a uh, knuckle line is called a uh, squamous part of the occipital bone, and this is part of the um, 
cranial vault, where the any part of the occiput below this line is part of the uh, cranial base. Then we have the sphenoid bone, and this is the sphenoid bone. So the sphenoid bone, the greater wing of the sphenoid, which is this one, which if you take the whole sphenoid bone, it would be this greater wing of the sphenoid. And we have here this uh, lesser wing of the sphenoid. Here we have the cella tersica. If you remember, you see it in the lateral cave. So this is the greater wing of the sphenoid. That's part of the cranial vault, while these ones are not. So only the cranial vault. So this is now what makes the cranial vault. So how the cranial vault grow? Now, the growth of the cranial vault is really linked with the growth of the brain. And the theory is believing that the main stimulus of the growth is the, uh, of, the man, of the brain, of the skull, sorry, of the cranial vault is related to the brain. So how is that happening? So here, let's assume that we have the brain. So the brain is growing up. When it's growing, it's pushing these bones up, uh, outward. When it's pushing this uh, bone outward, and here the sutures are open, then the suture has to do something we call it compensatory bone growth because other than that this area will become much bigger because these bones are moving outside so this movement outside this is displacement of the bone then we have a compensatory growth as the suture so that will maintain the integrity of this bone now when the bone is pushing outside we will have the brain is pushing outside we're going to have from the pressure side bone resorption and from the other side we're going to have bone deposition lacking or but the bone resorption is less than the bone deposition so at the end we're going to have translation and relocation as we said and in the same time the thickness of the bone will be increased so to say that again, the growth of the brain happened mainly because the brain, or the, sorry, the clavarium or the neurocranium happened because simply the brain is getting bigger. When the brain is getting bigger, it pushes these shelves or these cranial vault bones because they are separated, they are not joined together, away from each other. Then the suture has to compensate for this by growing. We call it compensatory growth at the suture. And because of the pressure from inside, we're going to have bone resorption and we're going to have bone deposition on the outer side. Now, this bone deposition is more than bone resorption, so the thickness of the bone will be increased. That's exactly what we were saying. So that's about the growth of the cranial vault. Now, what about the cranial base? So let's again review the anatomy of the cranial base. So this is basically the cranial base. It's more made from this part of the frontal bone, not the squamous part. Then we have this um, uh, ethmoidal bone, which where here, as you can see, it's penetrated with many holes. That's where the olfactory nerve goes, responsible for smelling. Then we have the sphenoid bone, where we have the cella tersica. We're going to have this greater wing of sphenoid and lesser wing of sphenoid. We call this the body of the sphenoid. And then we're going to have the temporal bone, but not the squamous part of the temporal bone. And we have the occipital bone, which is any part from the occipital bone below the line we just mentioned before. So that is the cranial base. And we know that the cranial base, it has primary cartilage. And we know that this cartilage is forming between the bones and we call it synchondrosis. So we know that the origin of the cranial base bone is from endochondral ossification, from ossification of the primary cartilage. Now, cranial base is very important in, in, in orthodontics because simply it provides a point of articulation between the skull and both the vertebrae here and the mandible, and that's what affect our work. So it supports the brain and provides a platform for the growth of the face. Now, so how this complex structure grow? What's going to happen? It will grow by two main mechanisms. The first one, because we have a cartilage, so definitely that's an endochondral ossification a growth. And here the cartilage and theory play a major role of the growth. Having said that, that does not mean that the growth is purely cartilaginous and we don't have any surface remodeling. In fact, we do. And we have as well a growth at the suture, as we're going to see later. So this is again the cranial base if I'm looking from the top and that's now we're going to look from the side in the next slide but now we are looking from the top. So here is the frontal bone, this is we go to the ethmoidal bone, sphenoidal bone, then here we occipital bone. If we look to the side we have this is the frontal bone we mentioned, this is the ethmoidal bone and here we have the sphenoethmoidal suture, uh, synchondrosis where we have cartilage. Then the sphenoid bone itself, it has a cartilage inside it, we call the intersphenoidal synchondrosis. And then we have a cartilage between the sphenoid bone and the occipital bone, we call it the sphenooccipital synchondrosis. 
all right and these cartilages what's going to happen during growth they will grow and they will push the bones around, away from each other and then this bone will be cal this cartilage sorry will be calcified having a new bone until the growth is finished this cartilage will be completely closed with a calcified bone and after that no growth will happen the sphenoethmoidal uh, synchondrosis which is this one will close by the age of seven while this uh, intersphenoidal synchondrosis, which is this one, just grows before birth. So basically, it does not have a huge influence and input to the growth. While the sphenoccipital synchondrosis, it will stay at the age 13 to 15 in females or girls and 15 to 17 in males. So most of the growth that we get is mainly due to the sphenooccipital, sphenoethmoidal, but not really from the intersphenoidal. And how the growth is happening at the cranial base? Because simply the cartilages are multiplying, pushing the bones away from each other, and then it will be calcified. Between the age of 4 to 20, the cranial base increases in length by an average 15 millimeter. That's for male, and for females, it's only 10 millimeters. However, if we, we are looking at the growth of the cranial base as only cartilage, that's completely wrong. Because yes, we do have a cartilaginous growth in the cranial base, and it's the main growth at the cranial base. But that does not mean that we don't have a sutural growth or an intramembranous growth. Because here, between the frontal bone and the sphenoidal bone, this is suture. And once the cranial base is increasing in length, then we should have growth at this area, the suture at these areas. And here we have this kind of suture, for example, the frontosphenoidal suture, which is this one, sphenotemporal suture, which is this one, and occipitomastoid suture, which is this area here. All these sutures, when the, the, the cartilage is pushing the bones away from each other, it uh, compensatory, again, growth of these two, two sutures are required. And also, we're going to have, definitely, because the brain is getting bigger, we can have remodeling as well by bone resorption from inside and bone deposition from outer side. Um, now we discuss the growth of the cranial base. It's worth mentioning that we usually divide the, mag the cranial base into two parts, anterior cranial base and posterior cranial base. The anterior cranial base goes from nasion into cella tercica. Why? The posterior cranial base, it's called from a cella tercica, which is the S point, to the basin, which is the lowermost point of the anterior margin of foramen magnum. This is foramen magnum, where the spinal cord go down. So the most anterior part of this is here, it's called basin. So the line from here to here, that's an anterior cranial base. The line from here to here is a posterior cranial base. Now, why is it important to distinguish? Because simply, the anterior cranial base mainly attached to it is the maxilla while the posterior cranial base mainly attached to it is the mandible. And here we have some, an angle between the anterior cranial base and posterior cranial base called the saddle angle. Now, if this saddle angle become increased and the mandible is attached to, this, uh, to the posterior cranial base, so it's going to happen, the mandible will be pushed more posterior. That will result in a retrognathic mandible in a class, three, class two. Sorry. While if this angle is reduced, then the posterior cranial base will move forward and the mandible will move forward, we're going to have a class 3. So yeah, the subtle angle, the angle between the anterior cranial base and the posterior cranial base will affect the malocclusion. However, at, after the age of 12, little uh, changes will happen to the uh, cranial base angle. And also, when we're talking about the cranial base, we need to mention something we call it superimposition. And uh, superimposition meaning that we take different radiographs and then we put them on top of each other to superimpose them and see what are the effects of the appliance we are using or the growth. So basically, if you look at this lateral kiff and you look at this one, so here basically what we did, we see, can see three colors. The black color is before treatment, the blue color is just mid-treatment, and the uh, red color is after, just before we finish the treatment, so three x-rays. So if I want to study the effect of the appliance itself, I need a structure, and this structure should be stable structure. Not affected by treatment, and what? Not affected by growth. So it should not be affected by the treatment I'm doing. I'm doing twin block, for example, here, so it's not affecting the cranial base, but then, it should not as well be affected by the growth. 
And here the tricky one, and here where we use a lot of the growth studies that happen. So cranial base and particularly anterior cranial base play a major role because we know that most of the growth will be finished by the age of five to seven. And it will still growing after that, but a very minimal growth. But main growth is finished by the age up to seven years of age. Most of the growth is being done. Most of it will be finished by the age of five, like in some of it will remain. However, after seven, we can say we don't have a lot of growth. So from the age of five through to, to uh, through to 12 years, 20 years, the distance from the cella to nasion, from here to here, will increase by eight millimeter in females and 10 millimeter in males. It's it's not too bad. Still, it's not stable to do that. So well, if you look at it and you look at the distance from cella to foramen cecum, which is this area, in the same uh, age range, it's only gonna uh, increase in the size by only three millimeter so this area is fairly stable after 20 years or 15 years it's only increased by three millimeter that's a fairly stable point so according to uh, Bjork and we're gonna mention Bjork later on his work on the growth he recommended the anterior cranial base as a stable structure when we do superimposition but you should not use the nasion because the nasion, as we mentioned now, there's a lot of growth happening from foramen cecum to the nasion. This is number one. And the nasion as well it will be affected by the frontal air sinus that is presenting here. If the frontal air sinus become increased in size, the nasion will be affected. For that reason, nasion is not the best point when we do superimposition. Anterior cranial base, yes, especially this part from cella to uh, foramen cecum, but not to nasion to do the superimposition. So now we finish talking about the cranial vault and cranial base. Now we need to talk about the growth of the face. Now generally speaking, the face as a whole will grow in a downward and forward uh, direction in relationship to the cranial base. Now we will divide the face into three regions, the upper face, nasomaxillary complex, and the mandible. So what is the growth of the, what is the upper face to start with? As upper face is this part here. It's just the eyebrows and what is the vertical distance above them. So it's the vertical forehead suited above the bare orbit. So this is the orbit, what is above it, this one, and straight one here. That's only the upper face that we are talking about here. And as we know that the growth in this area is really influenced and affected by the growth of the orbit, because according to the functional matrix theory, and also by the growth of uh, the brain, because that will affect the frontal bone as well. So here it's kind of mixture and it will be growing by um, resor bone resorption and bone deposition remodeling, but the growth is affected hugely by the, um, by the function of the orbits and the function of the brain. Now then, we're talking about the nasomaxillary complex. Nasomaxillary complex is representing the orbit, the nose, or the nasal cavity, the zygomatic process, and uh, the upper jaw, which is the maxilla particularly. So during the growth, all right, the maxilla and the orbit and the nasal cavity will grow in a downward and forward location, which basically orbit, as I said before, maxilla and the nasal cavity, all of them will grow in a downward direction. While the cheekbones and the zygomatic arch, they will grow laterally and are recorded in the post and relocated into more posterior direction. That makes sense because these organs are moving in this direction, the nasomaxillary complex. Now, this guy in the photograph is called Al Bjork. Bjork is one of the uh, most famous guys when it's come to studying the growth. Bjork has done an interesting study in the Royal London Royal Dental College in Copenhagen that was begun in the 1950s and what did he do he did a longitudinal study in which he did a place an implant a metal implant in 100 children uh, in both sexes so 100 male 100 females and then he continued by taking a series of x-ray and lateral care for these kids and that the age period in which he did his work was from 4 till 24. So basically what he did is he placed this mint metal implant, these two in the mandible. These are actually actually a photograph representing his work. And this one infrazygomatic in the zygoma here in the palate and here in this area above the central incisor. And the, the, the advantage of having the metal uh, uh, 
uh, indicator, this one, that you will know exactly what is happening about the growth. It's not going to be affected. It's going to be a stable point. It's not going to be affected by uh, bone remodeling, for example. So it's give you kind of accurate information. However, you can't do this study these days because simply of the ethical approval, because back in the time when Bjork did his study, we didn't know that we're going to have a cancer for this from radiation. So it was completely considered safe to take x-rays as if you're taking a photograph. So the implants remained in position throughout the study and served as a fixed reference point for the radiographic superimposition. Now the stability of these implants meant that these sites of growth and resorption could be identified with the individual jaws, and that's the beauty about this study. And these are all mentioned. So we know now the work that has been done by Bjork. Now this work that has been done through, uh, from Bjork, that's how we know the growth. So. Let's talk about the growth of the nasomaxillary complex and mainly talking about the growth of the maxilla. Now we know that the maxilla will be displaced in a downward and forward relationship on the face. So uh, now the, how this maxilla it, it, it will displace in this direction, nobody knows. It's debatable. So why the maxilla is now loaded downward and backward? They have too many theories again. The first one, the periosteal growth at the suture because we have here sutures this suture will going to grow and that will push the maxilla forward and we know now from this, describing this theories that this is the weakest theory and then we have the cartilaginous theory trying to explain why the maxilla go downward and forward and we say the car the nasal septum cartilage is the one pushing the maxilla down and forward and for a fact we know that the maxilla is moving downward and forward the other thing is the functional matrix theory that is associated with bone. So some sort of function is moving this maxilla downward and forward. So what we know for a fact that the maxilla during growth move downward and forward. And this growth usually happen at the suture, the, the joining the maxilla to the cranium. Now when the maxilla moving downward and forward, now this area here posterior to the stuporosity, it will become empty. So bone deposition will happen here and we will have an increase in the maxillary length. And that's kind of makes sense to accommodate for the unerupted teeth uh, to erupt. So as the maxilla go downward and forward, regardless of the cause, whether it's supposed to be osseli growth at the suture with the cartilage or whether it's functional matrix theory, maxilla is moving in this direction, downward and forward. We have plenty of space in the back and this space will be filled by bone and that will be here increasing the length of the tuberosity to accommodate so that we'll have an increase in the arch length to accommodate the uninterrupted teeth. And this is an example of the sutures that we mentioned. So we have the frontomaxillary suture, the gematicotemporal suture, and all the other sutures that are responsible in theory, if we believe in the sutural theory, in pushing the maxilla downward and forward. However, we said we have said that the suture is really growth size rather than growth center. Something else is pushing the maxilla downward. So the maxilla, I don't want you to get confused here. So the maxilla is a primary translation downward and forward that could be caused by sutural theory, cartilaginous theory, functional matrix theory. Other than that, also we have a secondary or a passive growth or secondary displacement that is caused by the growth of the brain. Because when the, the, the skull, the, sorry, the maxilla is attached to the anterior cranial base. And we just mentioned that the anterior cranial base length is increased during age. So once it's increased, it's going to move forward, taking with it the maxilla downward and forward as well. So if we get a study now that I'll summarize how the growth of the maxilla, which was in a way very uh, kind of complicated growth, it happens by three mechanisms. The first one is called the primary displacement. Sorry for that. The primary displacement, which basically the maxilla itself is displaced downward and forward. Why? Because of the septal cartilage. So the sutural growth that's pushing the maxilla forward because of the functional matrix theory that's pushing the maxilla forward. That will result in an increase in the bone deposition in the posterior side that increase the length of the um, tuberosity. And then the other cause is the bone remodeling. Now, what is bone remodeling that is happening when we do the maxilla? So the maxilla, we said that it displaced downward and forward. So let's assume in this direction. What is interesting that it is moving downward and forward, but the resorption is happening in the opposite, in the same direction. So it's resorption in this area and the deposition of the bone happening in the opposite direction to the displacement. 
So what will be happening that the maxilla is placed downward and forward, but it will grow in the posterior side. With, as we said, the tuberosity, so we're going to have bone deposition. And this bone deposition is more than the bone resorption in the front, so the tuberosity will increase in the sides. So as you can see, that's a good representation. This guy is pulling this trail forward in this direction, so to represent the maxilla growing in this direction. Resorption happening in this direction, in the opposite direction of the movement that we are having. So the bone resorption happening on this side, and we're going to have bone deposition on the opposite side. And that's exactly what happened with the maxilla. The maxilla is moving downward. The anterior or the frontal surface of the maxilla is resorbed, while the posterior surface we're going to have bone deposition on the tuberosity. The third and the last one of the uh, growth in the maxilla is called the displacement, and that's because secondary displacement of the growth of the uh, brain. So primary displacement, bone remodeling, and secondary displacement, these are the mechanism of the maxillary growth in the AB direction. The secondary displacement of the maxilla will cease by the age of seven years because definitely we said that the time the cranial growth is kind of finished so we don't have a lot of neurocranial growth and the growth of the maxilla by itself was slow by the age of 15 in girls and that will in the age of 17 in boys so we're talking about we were talking about the anterior posterior displacement of the maxilla so what about the transverse displacement yes the maxilla will get wider with age and the bone deposition usually happen at the suture of the maxilla the mid palatine suture and it's worth mentioning that the width of the maxilla will be increased more in the posterior side than the anterior side so we'll have a bone deposition in this area and bone deposition in this area but the bone deposition in this area and the posterior side is more than the bone deposition of the anterior area which make the maxilla wider posteriorly again we talked about the anterior posterior transverse now about the vertical so what's going to happen during the growth we said the maxilla is going downward and forward now, in the nasal cavity part, what's going to have is the bone resorption at the nasal cavity and bone deposition at the palatine side, which may going to make the nasal cavity bigger and it's going to make this uh, maxillary plate thicker. So, again, bone resorption from this side and bone deposition from this side. That will cause relocation of uh, the palate. Now, it's going to get thicker if we're going to have more bone deposition than more absorption, as we said before. Now, the maxilla, they are not only growing, they are also growing and rotated. And whenever you hear the word rotation, it's basically because there's a difference between the growth in the anterior fascia and the posterior face. If there is a difference in the growth between the anterior and the posterior part of the face, we're going to have rotation in the problem. So if you look at this one here, or this one, we, if we have a more posterior growth of the maxilla that will result in pushing the maxilla downward more in the posterior side and that will cause either keep it in this place or lift it up maxilla and the anterior side so that will cause a forward rotation of the maxilla or a counterclockwise rotation of the maxilla the opposite happens if we have more anterior growth and we have a clockwise rotation or a posterior growth rotation of the maxilla now the last part to talk about in the maxilla now we said that we need to do superimposition of the x-ray to do the superimposition we need a stable structure so we use the a stable structure of the anterior cranial base to detect the changes that they happen to the maxilla and to the mandible as a bony structure to maxillary teeth and the mandibular teeth as well so if you use the anterior cranial base we can distinguish if the effect of the movement or the growth is going to result in dental alveolar or a skeleton because if the for example if the mandible has moved forward the dentition will move forward as well so we can tell which one is due to skeletal which one is due to the dental to know the dental movement exactly we need to superimpose on the maxilla itself and we need a stable structure and according to Bjork the stable structure of the maxilla is the, the zygomatic process of the maxilla only so this is the zygoma and this is the zygomatic process of the maxilla the problem with this structure is that it's really hard to take on the x-ray and the OPG and the lateral cap, sorry. And for that reason, even Bjork, when he recommended this one, he said it's hard to identify. When we cover the lecture of the superimposition, we mentioned what are the alternative options. 
By this, we are finishing the growth of the mandible and uh, the maxilla, sorry, and we're going to move into the growth of the mandible. Now, again, the mandible is going to grow downward and forward in the relation to the cranial veins. And how is that happening? First, the condyle. The condyle is made of cartilage. The growth of the condyle is going to push the mandible downward and, uh, and, and forward away from the cranial base. So the condyle will grow, the cartilage will divide, and then it will be replaced by bone. And what is very important is bone remodeling. Mandible will go for extensive bone remodeling during growth. So what's going to happen, we need to, we're going to have bone resorption on the front side and then bone deposition on the opposite side. But we're going to have far more bone deposition than more resorption. That the whole round maramus will go in downward, backward rotation and it will increase in the size. So basically now, the growth of the mandible happening because of the condyle, pushing the mandible downward and forward, and because of a lot of remodeling taking place via resorption and bone deposition. Now, on average, 26 mm in female and 20 mm in female, that would be the growth of the mandible between the age of 4 and the age of 20, which is a lot of growth. And these dimensional changes, it will be accelerated when we have the growth spurt, the height growth spurt. And here where it comes the orthodontics role, just trying to do, for example, a twin block functional appliance treatment during the growth spurt. So we'll get most of the growth. So we are talking now about the cartilage. And we know the condylar cartilage has a role to do with the growth of the mandible. So the condylar cartilage, we remember from the imperiology, that is a secondary cartilage that developed away from the mandible when the ossification starts. And then they will join to each other. And here we have it like a, a carrot kind of shape. And after birth, it will be reduced to this small area that will keep dividing and will close completely by the age of almost 18. So, is the condyle a growth site or a growth center? Now, we mentioned before that the cartilage is playing an important role in the growth of the ma and the growth in general, according to the cartilaginous theory. And we said that if we take the cartilage and place it in a medium, neutral, it will grow independently, lacking, but it will grow in a different way because each cartilage is different from the other one. So, is the cartilage the primary cause and it will push, that's important, the mandible away from the cranial base or is the condyle really reacting to the force that are imposed in, in, in it due to the mastication and also to compensate for the growth that's happening due to the bone resorption and bone deposition that we mentioned on the ramus. So that bone resorption deposition is taking the mandible away from the cranial base. So then someone has to compensate and the cartilage here is going to grow to compensate for that growth. And actually, the belief is that, that the cartilage in the condyle is more of adaptive to the compression rather than being the main growth center. That will maintain the position of the mandible because if the mandible is going to grow downward and forward, there's something has to compensate for that growth by the growth that happened on the condyle. Now, when we talk about the growth of the mandible, now we have to mention the growth rotation of the mandible. Now, we mentioned that the maxilla can rotate upward or can it rotate downward. Now, the growth of the mandible is studied extensively by Bjork study. And when, when Bjork did his implant, we were thinking that before that, the mandible is just growing. But then elements of rotations came in because of the implant that Bjork used. So Bjork published in, with Schuyler in 1983 a paper describing three types of rotation of the mandible. However, that was a little bit difficult. So Solo and Houston, in 1988, they published the same thing, but in a simplest way. To understand exactly the growth, that's a kind of um, something you need really to focus to understand it. The first thing we need to understand is here. That's the Bjork study. Here we have two implants that are placed. And if you draw a line that represent that passing through this implant, that represents the inclination of the mandible, which is very similar to the mandibular plane, which we go from gonion to mentum. So there we have the mandibular plane, and here we have the plane passing through the implant. And we're going to see now what's the difference. And here we have the Frankfurt plane. So if the mandible rotates in this direction, this angle should get smaller. And if the mandible rotates in this direction, this angle should get bigger. 
So what's going to happen? The first thing that is going to happen that the rotation happen here anteriorly. So look at the black line here. The mandible rotated in the anterior direction. And how did we know that? Because we still like drawing this line that is passing through these two metal implants that are here on the mandible. So the mandible went in the anterior growth rotation. The mandible went in the counterclockwise rotation, which is basically something we say here that we have the rotation, we describe it as a counterclockwise or a clockwise. And usually the face should be facing to the right side. That's kind of the habit of it. So now the mandible, uh, according to these implants, are rotating on this direction, which is the counterclockwise or anterior growth rotation. But when we measure the mandibular plane, you can see that the mandibular plane is still similar. So why is that? Because we have something else happening, which is resorption. What happened when the mandible rotated in this direction, uh, which is basically anterior growth rotation, the ramus was resorbed in the opposite direction and there was a bond position in the direction. So at the end, the mandibular plane did not change. So what we see as a growth rotation was masked by the fact of, it was not the true growth rotation. It was masked by the fact that we have a little bit of resorption on the posterior side of the mandible that compensated slightly for uh, the growth that we are having. So basically, the mandible was rotated in this direction, which is basically a counterclockwise rotation, while the resorption happened in the opposite direction, which is basically clockwise. So that's kind of reduced the effect of the rotation. That's not the true rotation that we see. For that reason now, a BR came up, and then Solo in Houston, with uh, three types of rotation. The first one, they call it the true rotation, which basically now, uh, the mandible is rotated in this amount. And that's the true rotation, which basically, in you, if you want to measure the true rotation, you need to use the implant. So that's a rotation recorded according to the implant. That is called the true rotation, because we use the implant to identify this one. Then, the one we measure on the lateral cuff, the one we see it, it's called the apparent growth rotation, which basically the true growth rotation, we take from this the growth, the uh, remodeling that happened in the bone, which makes sense. So that will be the apparent rotation. And this is the rotation that we see on the lateral cuff. And we don't need metal to that. We just see it. That's a metal. That is the apparent rotation. That's what we, we measure when we do the maxillary mandibular plane angle on the lateral cuff. Then he mentioned the angular remodeling, which basically represents this area, which is the difference between the true rotation and the apparent rotation, which is basically the bone remodeling that took place. That resulted in reduction of the effect of the true rotation. So to summarize it again, we have the true rotation. And here they have the black line that before the rotation, and here is the red line before after the rotation. You can the red line moved all this distance. Now here, this one is called the true rotation, which basically the rotation that will take place between the mandible and the cranial base, and we record this rotation using the metal uh, uh, pointers or the metal references into the mandible, because that will tell you exactly how much rotation happened, and that's called true rotation according to Solo and Houston. While in uh, when the original paper in, um, from Bjork, it's called total rotation. And there is many uh, textbooks that describe this as an intra-matrix rotation, and it's part of the internal rotation. I'm just mentioning this one so you're not get confused because there's a lot of, of, of uh, names, they are all the same. And then we have the apparent rotation, which is the one we see on the lateral cuff. So basically, this is the rotation, the true rotation happened, and then we have a resorption that happens in, in the opposite direction. So now the rotation happened in the clockwise and counterclockwise rotation, anterior growth, anterior growth rotation. Then what happened, resorption happened in the opposite direction, resorption here and the position here. That will reduce the effect of the rotation. And here we have what's called the apparent growth rotation. And this is the result of the true rotation and remodeling of bone that is happening on the lower border of this one is called the apparent rotation in the Solo and Houston uh, paper. It's called the matrix rotation in the Bjork paper. And it's called as well in uh, part of the internal rotation. It's called the matrix rotation as well. 
The last type is what we call it the uh, angular remodeling, and basically this is the bone resorption. So the mandibles went this way in these photographs, but the resorption is happening with the opposite direction. We're going to have bone resorption here and bone disposition here, so the mandible will do this. So that reduce the effect of the rotation that already happened. We call this the angular remodeling, according to the Solo and the Houston. While um, uh, Schuyler and uh, Bjork, they call it intramatrix rotation. And in some textbook, they call it external, external rotation. So these are the three types of uh, rotation that happen to the mandible. And as well, there is a direction of the rotation that is discovered by Bjork. It's either forward growth rotation or backward growth rotation. All right. And usually that is happening whenever we have a rotation, as we mentioned with the maxilla, it's because there is an imbalance between the growth of the anterior part of the face or the posterior part of the face. So when you have a posterior growth rotation, like we see here, for example, that because, for example, the maxilla, which is grow vertically more than the ramus, so then the mandible went downward and backward. So imbalance between the growth in the anterior part of the face and the posterior part of the face, uh, anterior face side, posterior face side, will get result in rotation. This, this rotation could be an anterior growth rotation or posterior growth rotation. And this is how we examine it in the clinic using the Frankfurt mandibular plane angle or in the radiograph using maxillary mandibular plane angle. And this is here representing how the anterior growth rotation and the posterior growth rotation. Here's the anterior growth rotation. I'm sorry, uh, here's the before a growth rotation happening. And here what happened is the imbalance between the growth in the anterior part and the posterior part. So here the maxilla moved downward, pushing the mandible downward and backward. See here the distance is zero, while here the distance is about three to four millimeter that moved downward, which resulted in pushing the mandible downward and backward, causing rotation. It's a lot of theory trying to explain the growth rotation and, and how the imbalance between the anterior and the posterior growth happened. So if you look at this one, this is the skull, this is the mandible, this is the maxilla, this is the uh, vertebrae, and this is the hyoid bone. When the patient is growing, the, the vertebrae is growing, right? He's getting taller. That will push the mandible forward. On the same time, we have the, uh, that pushing the hyoid bone away from the mandible, and the mandible is attached to the hyoid bone by muscles. So what's going to happen in this case, that the hyoid bone is pushing the mandible on this side, while the uh, vertebral growth is pushing the mandible on the opposite side. If this one is not compensated, we're going to have a posterior growth rotation, if it's not balanced on both sides. And as well, the mandible here will grow as a result of the growth on the middle cranial base. Or the posterior cranial base. So, if no growth happened in the mandible to compensate for this downward pulling from the suprahyoid muscle and growth, we're going to have a posterior growth rotation. So, we have anterior growth rotation and posterior growth rotation, as we said. 80% of the sample that Bjork did the study on is the posterior anterior growth rotation, which means that they are the majority. But then he described them into three types. The first type in which the point of rotation is around the condyle. So if you look at the solid line, this is before the rotation, and the dotted line after the rotation. So that is a counterclockwise rotation or anterior growth rotation. And as you can see, the center of rotation is the condyle. Now this rotation resulted in movement of the mandible forward and upward. So that will result in reduction in the lower facial height. And it will result in a deep bite as well, because the mandible is moving up. Well, then we have the second type, and which is basically uh, the growth rotation, where the center of rotation is at the incisal edge of the lower central incisor. So basically, when the mandible is rotating, what's going to happen is the ramus is going to move downward. So the lower facial height will stay as it is, while the posterior facial height will be increased, or maybe normal. But the post, the, the lower, sorry, it will be increased while the lower facial height will stay as the same. Because look here, this is the straight line that represent the mandible before the rotation. This is the dotted line that represent the mandible after the rotation. So the ramus will go downward in this direction. So the lower facial height will stay the same. Then the third type of the rotation, which basically happen around the premolar, and usually this one happen when you have a large overjet or reverse overjet, in which the mandible will rotate around the premolar. So what's going to happen is the chin is going to move up from this side and it's going to move down from this side.
so that lower anterior facial height will be reduced while the lower posterior facial height will be increased. These are the three types of the growth rotation of the anterior growth rotation depending on the center of rotation. And if, if you remember when we did the examination lecture, we said not every patient with anterior growth rotation will necessarily mean that he will have a reduced lower anterior facial height because the center of rotation could be on the central incisor that will result in increase in the ramus height rather than reduction in the lower facial height. The second type of the growth rotation is the posterior growth rotation, and that happens in 80% of the population out of the sample that Bjork did the study on. So this is the green, the yellow line, the, sorry, uh, the red line before the rotation, the black line after the rotation. This is a type 1 rotation, again, where the center of rotation is in the condyle. So the mandible is going downward and backward. And that will result in increase in the lower facial height. There might be an interior open by the mandible will go more posterior. While the other type, where the center of rotation is in the most distal molar, and in these cases we can see like the, here the antigonial notch, like a notch here because the mandible going backward and receded in this direction. In these cases, the result would be increase in the lower facial height and reduction in the posterior facial height because the growth rotation is at this one, is centered here. So as a general belief, our generalized kind of stereotype or assumption Usually patients with uh, backward growth rotation, they will have a reduced overbite. I'm sorry, this one has to be here. Uh, they will have a reduced overbite and they will have, uh, this one are kind of replaced, this one has to go here. So backward rotation of the mandible or posterior growth rotation, usually they have anterior, increased lower anterior facial height, they will have a long face, the mandible is going posteriorly, so that's class two, and the overbite will be reduced. And during space closure, that will be more easily space closure. Why that's opposite in the anterior growth rotation, because there will be increased overbite, the lower incisors will become crowded with age, and there will be slow space closure. But again, not every patient with anterior growth rotation should have a deep overbite because we have a dento alveolar compensation. So that's kind of general features of these kind of malox occlusion. Now, Bjork, when he published his study, he published as well later a method that we can use to, uh, to predict the growth rotation, to know the growth rotation before it's happening. And you can call it the features that he can predict growth rotation. And he mentioned seven features that we need to look at when we decide the growth rotation. The first one is the inclination of the condylar head. Then the curvature of the mandibular canal, shape of the lower border of the mandible, inclination of the mandibular symphysis, inter-incisor angle, intermolar and inter uh, premolar angles and the last one is the anterior facial height and the overbite so this one here represents patient with anterior growth rotation while this one is posterior growth rotation so the first feature will be the condyle in the patient with anterior growth rotation it will be inclined forward while in the patient with posterior growth rotation it will be inclined posteriorly and the mandible mandibular canal here it will have a curvature greater than the mandibular contour. So you can see here we have a greater curvature, while here we have a slightly flat mandibular canal. Now the lower border will be uh, anteriorly con um, rounded and it will have a little bit of convexity at the angle. Here one, that one will be thinner, uh, the lower border will be thinner anteriorly and it will be convex as well. The fourth one is the symphysis. The symph and that's kind of a very important feature. The symphysis is inclined forward with the face and the chin is prominent. So those patients usually have a prominent chin. While the posterior growth rotation, usually it, the, man, the chin is receded. They have a progeny, retrogenia. The interincisal angle and the intermolar and interpremolar angle, the, all of them are increased in the case of anterior growth rotation and reduced in the cases of posterior growth rotation. And last uh, one is the lower facial height. Usually patients with anterior growth rotation, they tend to have a reduced lower facial height with tendency to increase the overbite, completely the opposite in posterior growth rotation. They will have an increased lower facial height and anterior open bite. Now, finally, when you see an X-ray like this, that's now the growth rotation happened already. So these features, sometimes we use it when the patient are growing just to tell if the patient is going to grow anteriorly or posteriorly. However, this is how the growth rotation is going to look like. This is an anterior growth rotation, and this is a posterior growth rotation. 
Now, as we are talking about growth, we just mentioned that we have something we call it dental alveolar compensation. So dental alveolar compensation is what the tissue or all the dentition are trying to do to mask the severity of the malocclusion that we are having. And the mechanism of doing so is by tooth eruption, soft tissue forces and the occlusal forces. Failure of dental alveolar compensation will result in a malocclusion. Now, if the malocclusion is really severe, then the dental alveolar compensation can compensate it and the patient might need surgery. Like for example, in this patient, here's a class three, now an anterior open bite. You can see that the lower incisors are extremely retroclined by the force from the soft tissue, which basically the uh, lower lip, trying to compensate for this class three, but it's failed because it's severe malocclusion. As well, the tooth eruption, the tooth eruption of the upper and lower incisors are trying to over rub to correct the open bite, but again, they stopped and they can't do that because it's so severe. So the more dental alveolar compensation that we have and we still have a malocclusion, the more patient will go for surgery because there's already dental alveolar compensation happened. The less dental alveolar compensation, the more chances that we don't have to go for surgery. Um, the last topic in this lecture is to talk about growth prediction. Now we need to check the growth. We need to predict growth. Why is that? If you look at this patient here, she's a class three, and we mentioned that before. And I want to know what's gonna happen with the mandible and what's gonna happen with the maxilla. And I need to know when and how much growth is gonna happen because that will affect my treatment. If I know when the growth is gonna happen, so I know when to start my treatment. And which one is gonna grow more? So is it gonna get better or get worse? And how much? And can I use growth modification to stimulate the growth? All of this is called growth prediction. So how can we predict growth? The first method is the chronological age. And from last lecture, we agreed that chronological age is not accurate because it does not tell you about the biological growth, about the maturity, just tell you how old is the patient. Then we have the physiological parameter, which basically include the peak growth velocity in standing height. And we mentioned last time that you measure the uh, height of the patient and you measure the height next year. So basically you plot the change in the height. And when this change in the height is start jumping, that means he's getting into the pubertal growth spurt or the adolescent growth spurt. And it's worth mentioning that this is the most valid representation of the rate of overall skeletal growth. However, the problem with this one, it's historical. It's useful to give you a historical longitudinal measurement of the individual, but little prediction for the value of the future growth rate or the total growth remaining. So basically what you can do, if you have a patient and you keep measuring the height and the, um, uh, the, the rate of the growth spurt, and then you can say, okay, listen, he's growing high in this area and he's jumping, the growth is increased in this area, this is the growth spurt. Then how long this growth spurt is gonna stay, you can tell. And then uh, how much growth is left, you can tell. So mainly it's a historical things to give you. However, it's considered the gold standard to assist the validity of any prediction method. Because this is the gold standard about it. This is the most accurate one. The second physiological one is to use the pubertal markers, like the secondary sexual characteristics, like the hoarseness of the voice, and growing a beard and the mustache. Now, they are usually good, but then it tells you that the growth spurt has passed. So if you come patient to your clinic and say, okay, uh, and you see him now, and you see him after three months, and you notice that there is a hoarseness on the voice and he got taller, so now he kind of passed the growth spurt. And here it comes the radiographic assessment to guess the uh, maturation stage. The first method basically is to use the hand wrist radiograph. So you send the patient to take a hand wrist radiograph, and then uh, you, this radiograph, it see the, the bones that in the hands, and all of them, they have a series of ossification that we can use to see, identify the maturation age of the patient by either compare it to the atlas or having something like calcification index or calcification number. The problem with this method is that first, the reliability for it is slightly low. And the second one is that because it's not really reliable, then it's not, you not really can take it for granted. Then you are exposing the patient to the extra radiation. And we know for a fact that the carcinogenic effect and the health uh, issues related to extra dose of exposure is really critical. 
For that reason now, it's not justified at all because to take a hand rest radiograph just to do a growth prediction. Because we know that the method is good, but it's not that reliable. And also, we don't need to expose the patient for an extra radiation. So not anymore, no hand rest radiograph to predict growth. So here it's come, the cervical vertebrae maturation rate. So basically this idea, because we take an lateral kiff anyway for our patient, and the cervical vertebrae is there, so we can use the cervical vertebrae in our prediction of the growth. This work was done basically first by Lamparski, in which he linked the maturation of the cervical vertebrae to the change in the height. And then a team by Bacchetti, Franchi, and McNamara, they did in which they used this work done by Lamparski and they came up with something they call it the cervical vertebrae maturation and that was validated by Bacchetti in 2005. So the whole idea is to look at the morphology and the anatomy of C2, C3, and C4. And by looking at this one, C2, C3, and C4, you decide the stage of the development. So what did Bacchetti do in 2005? He basically went to the growth study done in uh, Michigan. And as we mentioned before in the growth study lecture, that we have lateral kiff taken for the patients. And then he measured the mandibular length, which basically from condylon to gnathion. And he noticed, he, he looked into the data and so where we have a huge increase in the mandibular growth. So they t between two x-rays. So that will be considered as the pubertal growth spurt for the, the mandible. Then he took two x-rays before and two x-rays after. So he had six x-rays in total. So then he had a sample of 30 subjects, 18 boys and 12 girls. And he came up with the, uh, he validated the cervical vertebrae, uh, the one that is proposed by uh, Lamparski and Frankie. But at that time, when they proposed, they proposed six stages. When Bacchetti came, said, okay, first stage and second stage are almost similar. We don't need them, so we're gonna have only five station stages. So for the cervical vertebrae maturation rate proposed by Bacchetti, it's only six stages. While the original one is six, uh, sorry, for the Bacchetti one is five stages, while the original one is only six stages. Before I leave from here, just notice the sample size. The sample size is only 18 boys, 12 girls. So it's a very small sample size to generalize the results into population. However, this is the one that is proposed by Bacchetti, in which you look at the cervical vertebrae. For example, if you look at the S, uh, stage of S1, the lower border of the C2, C4 should be flat, and uh, both C3 and C4 are trapezoid in shape. Then the CS2, it's the same, but the lower border of the C2 is uh, convex. Uh, concave sorry and that's how you go all the way through and this is here written explaining each stages as i mentioned before Pachetti combined the two of the cs1 and cs2 into one stage and they call it and he called it cervical vertebrae maturation stage number one and what they found with the michigan growth study that when you are in CS1 or CS2, which is according to Bacchetti, cervical vertebral maturation rate 1, the peak of the mandibular growth will occur on average uh, after two years. Okay, so not before two years from now. When you are in CS3, the peak mandibular growth will be achieved within one year after this stage. So if you saw this patient, so within the coming year, we're going to have the growth, the peak of the mandibular growth. So when then that's the appropriate time to start the treatment because within the coming year, he gonna have the growth spurt. So that means that this is the best time to start the treatment and that's called the CS3. Or according to Bacchetti, that's cervical vertebrae maturation rate stage number two. If it's CS4, that's I mean the mandible is, has achieved the growth spurt within the one year that has passed already. So basically he passed the growth spurt within the last year. Well then CS5 and CS6 that the mean mandibular growth spurt has been ended at least one to two years before the start of the treatment. So there's no need for any um, treatment to be done. When they did the work on Michigan growth study, they found that uh, during the CS3, the increase of the mandibular length was 5.4, which is a huge amount of the increase. While in the CS1 to CS2 and CS2 to CS3 is only uh, was only uh, 2.5 uh, 
uh, millimeter of its changes in the um, length of the mandrel. So the biggest change occurred in the CS3 moving to CS4 stage, and that's why it's considered the growth spurt of the mandible. So I just brought your attention to the original study that is used to get into the cervical vertebrae maturation length. And we said it's only 18 boys and 12 girls. So the sample size is not big. And here a guy called Millen in, in 2013, or Million, and he's trying to um, identify how accurate are these ones. So he published a paper in the American Journal of Orthodontics in which he utilized the R sheaf that is uh, present for Bolton and a um, growth study in Cleveland, Ohio. And he investigated, or the team investigated, the pattern of the facial growth and their relationship to the various common index of maturation. So he has all the records that he needs, the height, the weight, the uh, lateral gift. And so he looked back at the x-ray and said, okay, I have this hand rest x-ray, I'm gonna predict when the growth spread is gonna happen. And then he went back, and because he has the height of the patient, and we described that the height is the golden standard, and he compared the results of the, his lateral kiff into the height results that is the growth study and see if this is accurate or not. And he used 100 children, 50 males and 50 females, which is a good number of the sample. And what he came up with the conclusion is that the peak of the pubertally growth spurt in height, facial size and mandibular length for female happened at the age of 10, 11 and a half and 11 and a half respectively, which means what we are concerned about the mandibular length, the peak of the mandibular growth happened at the age of 11.5, while the height growth spurt at the age of 11, which means it's very early to what we used to know. So we should maybe treat our, the females slightly earlier. While for me, for me, the peak of the mandibular growth happened at the age of 14. That's according to the uh, Bolton uh, study. But what is more important is he, when he looked at, to see if I'm using this prediction method and see when the growth is gonna happen, how accurate is that? So hand wrist radiograph provided the best indication that maturation had reached and the big velocity stage, which is the height and the uh, chronological age was nearly as good. So he ranked them as the hand wrist radiograph the best, then the big velocity stage combined with the chronological age is as good, but the cervical vertebrae maturation was the worst. And I'm not going to say that makes sense, but the sample size that they are used to do this study is fairly low. So cervical vertebrae maturation rate is very popular at the moment. You can use it. But the thing is, when you need to use it, you need to use it with knowing the advantages and disadvantages and pros and cons for such a system. The last topic here now to talk about is the craniofacial growth studies that we mentioned and orthodontic research. So we know that when we do a study, we do a randomized clinical trial and to see the efficiency of, for example, using twin block. Now, when you want to divide the sample into treatment or a non-treatment group, we have a big ethical dilemma here. If the treatment is efficient, how you come? You're gonna prevent or you're gonna um, not provide treatment for certain group. How ethical is that? And here came sometimes that they do using a control group, like no treatment from the studies, the growth study that has been published. So you use the growth study sample as a control group. And doing that, having a huge advantage is like it, avoid the problem with difficulty associated with having a randomized clinical trial. Data can be obtained directly from the study archive. It's much cheaper and the project can be uh, carried out quickly. And as we said about the ethical dilemma, that's a main issue as well. Well, at this advantage, there is Bias, selection bias in the control of the record because here I can select the control that I wanted and here we have a bias of the selection. And also it's not possible to measure the outcome that are relevant to the patient. For example, the self-esteem or the satisfaction. So we're going to say, okay, I'm going to evaluate uh, which one is more comfortable for the patient, self-ligation bracket or conventional bracket. So you can't use the control group because you can't ask the patient questions at the moment. And the other thing is the secular changes in the growth. And what is the secular changes? Now, the secular trend referred to the fact that over the last 120 years, children have been getting taller 
and they grow into maturity more quickly. So the new generation are really bigger than the older generation. And why is that? The main determinant of that is the social economic status. So the, be, during the days that the food is developed, the social economic status is developed compared like 200 years ago. So better food, better nutrition, better circumstances, better growth. And if you look at this study that is published in Oslo, and the growth study, you can see that this is one for boys and this one for girls, that the growth rate is going fine, fine, the height, sorry, the height of the mean height is going high, 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 is increasing, and then all of a sudden the growth high is dropped, and then it's come back increase, increasing with age. And here as well for the females, the growth height in the 1920s was low, and as the life is getting better, better economy, better nutrition, there's still the increase in the average height, and then all of a sudden it's dropped down. And why is that? Look at the date, 1940. What's happened in 1940, the Second World War? So when we had the Second World War, World War, we have a problem with food, we have a problem with nutrition, we have a problem with the growth as well. But then it's catched up again after that because the growth, the, the war is over and the kids were able to eat properly as they used to be. And here another study published by Anton, in which what he did, he went back into the lateral kiff and he looked at the, no, at the average of the SNA value for uh, the patients in the study, for the females and the males, and he brought them in the graph. So you can see the 1945, 1955, 1965. As you can see, with years and the, the size or the SNA is increased, which means the size of the skull is increasing. So with age, each 10 years happening, that will result in an increase in the size of the, uh, of the patient. And that's confirming what we call it the secular effect. For that reason, using um, the studies from uh, the growth studies, the sample from the growth studies, kind of having a big question mark because of this secular effect as well. And that goes again to the growth study of the cervical vertebrae maturation rate because it's driven from the growth study as well. And it's validated by the growth study. So all of this just need to be taken into consideration when you're using anything. And that's it. Thank you for listening.